Alright, um, um, today we have some very special guest, by the way. Uh, his name is John Lin, who is sitting right behind over there. He's from Singapore and he uh, was my student at NTU before. And uh, he graciously came here to meet you, meet you guys. Um, he's been working at a company called M Clinica. In, which is a medical big data company in Singapore, featured in Forbes uh, a couple of years ago as the most promising, one of the most promising startup companies in Singapore, like under 30, top 30. Um, can I show you that? charge of finance and uh, so um, well how shall we proceed I have one or uh, also one uh, student who is trying to present about uh, uh, Korean Airlines and uh, so um, what about this uh, why don't we invite uh, invite John first and let's take about 10 minutes for you know his saying hi and then talking about his company and then given that his company is a startup company uh, how to you know uh, finance those uh, venture and these things right um, how do you apply your concepts that you learned right into your real business you can ask these questions to him um, and then we'll move on to uh, Park Hyun and uh, one more in uh, talking about what's been happening in Korean Airlines and then um, <clears throat> John will stay here until 1.30 so that he will join you guys in uh, you know bothering me or questioning me or whatever and then refreshing his memory he, he's been visiting here right getting back to John right he's been visiting uh, since Friday that's Friday and then he's frequently visiting us, um, like in Korea. And also, not only that, uh, in January, he kindly, you know, uh, met us in our Global Career Tour. Anybody who joined the Global Career Tour, please raise your hand. Do you remember his? Were you in the same table? No different table? Right. But we had two tables, so that's why. But um, he, uh, he graciously came and that meeting as well. Um, so, let's give him a big hand as John comes up to the podium. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good, good. Um, so, I think about Six years ago, I was a six seven years ago. I was a student of Professor Kim, and I think you know, like I think you guys would, would probably feel the same way that I do. He is uh, someone who manages to teach the concepts of finance, which may not be the most interesting things in the world, uh, but he's able to articulate it in a way that's very funny, very humorous, right? I mean, he, he always makes me laugh. He always makes me laugh. But um, not because it's a joke, but I think because uh, he manages to, to express the content in a very humorous way. Uh, so today, you know, I'm just here on, on a holiday trip. Uh, you know, I asked Professor Kim if he was uh, free to meet. And of course, you know, lo and behold, suddenly I'm here holding a mic in front of <laughs> you guys. Uh, but yeah, so um, for me, I actually started my career in finance uh, doing much as an acquisition advisory. Uh, but soon after, um, I managed to um, well stumble upon or met with the founder of a 
big data company in healthcare that's called Clinica. And of course, mergers and acquisition advisory. Uh, in other words, okay, we do the advisory, but we don't underwrite the financing, so it's not a pure investment bank. Uh, but it's mostly an advisory firm. But I think, you know, when doing an advisory firm, you're always on the sidelines, right? You are advising companies whether you should um, buy or sell certain, um, certain business divisions, you know, especially back in the days, uh, leverage buyouts were very common. So, you know, using public companies, they would spin out certain business divisions uh, via like LBOs, who were, were, I think, the rich those days. But eventually, uh, anyway, I managed to bump into the founder of uh, Clinica, which was doing uh, essentially big data in the emerging markets around Southeast Asia. I thought that was a meaningful, I thought that was a meaningful thing to do because, you know, in Southeast Asia, a lot of the countries' data is very scarce, data is very difficult to come by. And if we manage to, at that point in time, the world was sort of transforming from feature phones to smartphones. If we manage to write this shift, then we could essentially create immense value for the ecosystem or the healthcare ecosystem around Southeast Asia. So long story short, I joined the firm and um, it, it, it has been great so far, right? Um, but I think what is more pertinent and what is more important today perhaps is to I think relevant to this class is to translate what I've learned uh, in finance into um, you know building a, a great company, right? So along the way, as you grow and scale the firm, you need finance, you need funds to grow the business, right? A lot of people think about uh, finance in a very extract, extract terms without without you know really noticing what's it for. Um, on the ground, actually, you need um, the concept that all you all you guys are learning right now into. Um, convincing investors or convincing the market that hey, I'm worth a certain uh, price, I'm worth a certain value and as such, you know, I, um, it's fair for me to ask for a certain amount of fundraising or a certain amount of funds in exchange for a certain percentage of my company uh, so that you, know, you can use the funds towards you know, growing the business in marketing, in um, hiring talent in uh, building excellent product. You need the engineers, you need the marketers, you need, sometimes you need the funds to fund discounts so that you can win the market share, right? Especially in you know, Uber, I mean. You guys don't have Grab here, right? Uber, Grab, Uber, no. No. Uber. Uber is forbidden, but we have, uh, the taxi unions are so strong. I see, uh, I see, I see. What do we have, what do we have instead? Kakao Taxi, Kakao Taxi, that's uh, a, Joint work with the existing taxi company. Mm. Are there any other alternatives like Uber? Do we have any? Well, are there any other companies that uses, uh, well, for one, well, I can't say too much about this, but for one, I know that um, Coupang, I think, which is a very big e commerce player here, they are funding a lot of, um, they are funding a lot of discounts, they are funding a lot of, uh, they're building their own uh, delivery fleet now. Um, you know, I think same on next day delivery, and they need a lot of funds to do that. And uh, right now, they are not. I think it's public news. They are not profitable. Uh, I don't know if you can say that. But um, yeah, in a nutshell, you do need the um, you know finance skills and knowledge that you learn right here in order to be able to translate that into raising funds successfully for your firm, so that you can grow the firm, either to fund discounts to hire engineers or to hire marketers or to hire salespeople, right? So I think, um, what was I going to say? I think I just sort of briefly glance at you know, some of you guys' laptop right now uh, at the back that you guys are learning the concept of beta today. Is that, is that right? So, 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 yeah, I, yeah, so that was one of the things that uh, I managed to, I had to overcome in my early days at Antonica because I had to come up with a valuation for the firm back then. And one of the ways that you can do that is, of course, you got to do your DC, F. DCF. Yeah. Okay, you guys know DCF? Yes. Right, you got to do your DCF, and to be able to do the DCF, you need to come up with the uh, WAC. Uh, to come up with the WAC, you need to get your cost of equity. To get the cost of equity, you need um, you know, the capital model, you need your beta, right? So, um, getting the beta for a young, unlisted company is very difficult. It's very difficult, right? Today you probably will learn about leveraging and unleveraging, you know, the, the, the levered beta to get at uh, your own levered beta. But, you know, we are young, we are venture funded, we had no debt, so that equation is useless, the Hamada equation. Uh, 
Um, so what we had to do was to try and relate. We had to find alternative ways to find what is the beta that is accurate for us. Eventually, when you go onto the market, you will find alternative ways to, to triangulate certain things, to triangulate certain features in the type of model that is very hard to estimate. Um, and, well, to cut a long story short, it was a very painful process uh, of applying what I learned in Andy Kim's class <laughs> into a valuation model to convince the investors to say, hey, we are worth this much money, invest in us in exchange for this percentage of the company. And well, it has managed to work out well so far. So I'm happy to say that you know, part of my, I won't say success, but part of my um, early traction is due to what you know, Professor Kim has taught me. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm happy to answer any question that you may have, uh, be it um, working in Singapore, or even about you know, applying whatever that you guys are learning in school or in class today into real life examples and about convincing actual investors into investing in you. So I'll just share an anecdote. The first time I had to raise venture funding from VCs was uh, very, very scary because um, of course even, I mean, even when I was doing like, you know, m and advisory, I mean, that kind of work, I wasn't an analyst, right? Like, a, like you know, fresh out of school. Uh, an experience like that is not enough to sort of make you be absolutely confident in front of VCs, uh, in front of investors who will either give you the UK, whether you live or you die, right? So that was that was a bit, um, well, that was a bit, I, did, I guess I think the word for it is, uh, allows you to, makes you shake in your boots a little bit. But um, I think the technical grounding that whatever he will teach you will be very, very solid if you apply your mind to it. And um, yeah, happy to answer any questions. I think I ran along a little bit. Great. So, um, any questions? Throw it to him. Uh, yeah. How about the data technology? to learn because we are students of uh, business administration so it is very awkward uh, awkward uh, study for us data technology mm. so how, how about your thing think because you are in the uh, data form right, right 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 I understand your question so I think what he's asking is you know um, you guys are in business administration right right yes. yeah. <laughs> Um, you guys are in business administration, like how do you apply or how do you take that what you're learning right now into essentially what is called the big data economy, right? I think one of the, well I'm not sure about the curriculum and the syllabus here, but I think one of the syllabus that at least I learned was statistics. Do you guys learn that as well? <laughs> right. So I think statistics, if you master it well, will put you in very good speed in um, the big data economy. Um, big data actually is just a very fancy word, right? People use the word like, you know, big data, blockchain, you know, artificial intelligence. But some of them don't even have artificial intelligence in their product. But um, at, the, at the very base of it is uh, actually statistics. Why? Because if in the past, if you had to program something, right, you had to be very specific, right? If something happens, then a certain output occurs. And you have to apply that for every single use case, right? For example, the very early example was teaching uh, a computer how to walk, right? So you can say, you know, first you lift up the leg, then you extend your leg, and then you put down the leg, right? But if you do that to a computer model, it won't work because what happens is that actually walking is a, is a series of very, very, very complex behavior, not just lift up, extend, and put down. And humans are not able to program those things very, very explicitly in something like walking. So you have to do what they call like, uh, essentially, uh, you have to let the machine learn what is the correct way to do certain things, how to essentially how to really walk, to teach the computer model how to walk. And the way they teach the model how to walk is to use statistics to show that this actually is the best way to learn how to walk. So they will try all sorts of different variations, you know, maybe they will run through a million or even 10 million iterations of them. And then they will find statistically what is the best one that can give you the best results. Uh, 
so in a nutshell, of course, I'm just uh, doing a lot of hand waving here. But in a nutshell, that's how um, a lot of this underlying technology work, especially when it comes to machine learning, especially when it comes to uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So if you ask me if you want to position yourself in that kind of economy, I think a solid understanding in statistics will be very, very helpful. Right? You may not be the actual one you know, coding up the statistical model or doing the uh, programming languages to make it happen, but uh, as a business person, being able to understand it, being able to talk intelligently about it, and not get smoked by you know, people that you hire or you work with, I think that's really very powerful enough. Thank you. So, first of all, thanks for coming all the way here and sharing your story. Um, I want to ask, uh, so what's your everyday life as a CFO and a client? Wow, so uh, that, that's very varied, right? Um, but that's a good question, right? So at the very early stage, when I first joined the firm, there was only eight people in the firm, and we were in a, a little dingy room with like, holes on the floor, because back then it was pre-funding. But it was just an idea that I thought was very powerful, so that's why I decided to join. Um, so back then, you know, even though the title was CFO, I was actually doing a little bit of everything, right? Going to customers' meeting, going to uh, meeting investors, um, basically a little bit of everything. But slowly as the firm grows, uh, right now we have about 100, 100 of people. Um, as the firm grows, your scope becomes more and more nuanced, becomes more and more defined. So uh, essentially, a lot of the work that you do have to, I think, sort of encompass a few things. One, day-to-day -day life is, uh, in the day-to-day -day life, you have to manage you know, the investors very well. Because you know, if you raise money from them, let's say you raise 20 million from them, they will say, hey, what are you spending on? Right? You can't just say, I spend it all on like, you know, partying and like, you know, drinks and, and, and things like that. You have to say, okay, line by line, you know, pretty much how you spend those money, how you spend, uh, what are the line items that goes into the spending. Um, and if you spend it on marketing, what is the ROI on the marketing that you spend it on? Uh, if you hire engineers, uh, where are they from? What's their background? What have they done so far? And why do you need these many engineers? So a lot of it is convincing and working with and massaging the concerns and allaying the fears that current investors may have. That's one. Second one is you work internally with the team. In, for example, the let's say I want, I want to go very fast in Vietnam, right? Uh, suddenly, you know, we have this target to uh, get to say uh, fifty thousand pharmacies in a particular place. So you got to work backwards, okay? To get fifty thousand pharmacies, how many sales reps do I need? How many biz dev person do I need? I need an office. I need to get all my permits and licenses, I need cars maybe. All of this goes in, essentially it's budgeting. Right? All of this you work backwards, you go into a budget, uh, which goes into your forecast, which goes into essentially a pack that you would send to your investors at the end of the month. Right? But that's working internally. And um, besides that, you also have to work uh, with building the what they call a G&A team, a uh, general and administration team. So you know, besides building up the finance team, you got to build up the HR team. You got to build up essentially the administrative team that can support the businesses uh, around you so that they can do their best. So it's very varied. Um, it it varies because um, throughout the different phases of the company, you will do different things. At the very start, you do literally everything, including maybe turning out the trash, turning out the aircon. Uh, but towards the end, uh, then maybe your work becomes a bit more focused, where you, um, you know, essentially liars with the investors a bit more. That's why you sit in Singapore, because most of the investors, uh, they would sit in Singapore. So I would sit in Singapore to, you know, in case there's anything, I can be there in person. Um, and yeah, building the morale, building the culture, uh, you know, by hiring the right person to be the GNA team. I think, uh, in a nutshell, that's what I do in, in the day to day. Right. Some more questions? Yep. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. Like from what I've heard from you, it seems like you have solid dream for finance. Like you start your early career as a part of finance firm and now you're the CFO in some in big co startup company. Mm. But what makes you to join the finance firm? Like in the first place? Yeah, in the first place. Oh. 
This one actually is a very good question that I don't even have a very clear answer to myself. So my earliest training um, has nothing to do with finance. Initially, you know, like, like, like many Asian students or, or, or parents growing up, you grow up, you know, what do you want to be a doctor, you know, a lawyer, you know, something like that. But what happened, I think what piqued my interest was back then there was the financial crisis 2008-2009. And by right, you know, you should turn people away from finance, right? Because, you know, uh, you know essentially the finance professional cause uh, a map about the economy, da, 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 da. But strangely, it had the opposite effect on me because it, it actually made me more intrigued about the uh, financial system, about what finance professional uh, do. And I say, hey, you know, this seems like a profession where you can get the power because you would have the power to bring down the entire economy if you, <laughs> if you, you know, do certain things that are essentially are in the, uh, maybe it's new and not so regulated, like mortgage-backed securities, right? Essentially, that thing will ruin you. But yeah, I think to answer your question, I don't have a, I don't have a, a definitive moment because when you grow up, you kind of know like what your parents want you to be, super standard stuff. I think it's the same here. Um, I think what made me peak, what what piqued my interest was the financial crisis. Yeah, and wanted to explore. It's actually as simple as that. And I mean, for me, even when I joined business school the first year, I didn't have to I didn't have to say that or declare that I want to be a finance major. At that point, I could have been actuarial science, marketing, finance, HR. Right? I only have to declare my second year. So I think, yeah, in a nutshell, over time, you know, what the, the interest that, you know, was peaked in me became more and more uh, intense. And when it became more and more intense, and I started, you know, exploring the finance, uh, exp exploring the finance path. And one thing led to another, I was too deep to get out anyway, so I just stayed in it. But it's a, it's a, it's a fun, it's a fun profession. It's very intellectually stimulating. I feel, especially you know, later on as you get to the different equations, maybe you will learn about the black shows model at some point, uh, options pricing, and you think about like, how do they how do they come up with this equation of price and option? Why did they come up with this equation of price and option, right? Apparently, uh, from what I recall, it has something to do with the heat exchange equation by Myron Black and uh, sorry, uh, by Fisher Black and Myron Shows. So I thought it was a bit interesting. Um, and definitely, I don't think it's something that you guys will, will regret taking. I think it really sets you uh, apart from the rest of the working world when it comes time for you to, to embark on your professional career. Because for someone who is well-versed in finance, who can understand the levers about driving the valuation of a company, this person will always be very, very valued in the firm. And this is like not just in a startup company, but even in big firms, like a General Electric or a city, or like a city bank. I'm not saying where that where I was from. That's where I was from, but I'm just saying it's also valued there. You started for, as a General Electric. General Electric, yeah. 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 Before GD that, capital, I, wasn't it? Yeah. Right, so GE capital. was very big back then. Now right. it's not very big, lah. But uh, um, GE Capital. Yeah, I think the work stuff. Um, some part of it's confidential still. So oh, right. yeah, yeah, I can't, yeah. can't say too much. Cool. But um, General Electric was big from. Yeah. Um, they had a lot of the different verticals. They had the G Capital side, which functions like a bank. They also have other verticals like aviation, healthcare, lighting. So it was very, very big. Uh, but that was where I started my career. Yeah, on the inside, not on the inside. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Mm, sure. Sorry. Yeah, you started your career at G, right? Yeah. But you said it was only eight years ago in in non company. It was only eight years the first time, right? In, in, in actually, uh, it was only eight years the first time you said, right? Sorry. What did you say? Sorry? I mean, it was only eight people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When, when your first yeah, time, yeah, yes, 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 yes. I mean, why did you move your company to a small company? I mean, most of the Korean people don't want to oh, yeah, join yeah, 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 yeah. company. That's a very good question. And that's the question that um, I think most of my peers would face, to be frank, back at back the point in time, because, you know, um, you're in a large firm, why do you want to leave to join a small firm? I think it was a combination of a few factors. I think the first factor was that I strongly believe in the idea that um, with this sort of uh, era shift, 
as the world shifts from feature phones to smartphones, especially in the emerging markets. Back then, they don't have MacBooks or like PC, that, you know, laptops and things like that, right? So a lot of things that the processors that they had was literally pencil and paper. But with the rise of the smartphone industry, right, it was their first ever um, computing device. It was, it was their first ever computer. So we realized that with this shift in the emerging markets, we could take advantage of this shift and create an, an application platform that runs on this um, smartphone internet or mobile internet era. And maybe we can make a bit of change out of it. So that was one I was very convinced about the idea that with this, you know, every shift has an opportunity, right? That with this shift, we can make something out of it. That's one. And secondly, I was very fortunate to have um, uh, very supportive parents who said, hey, you know, maybe, uh, you know, just give it a shot, you're still young, you know, if it doesn't work out, it's still fine. You, I haven't taken my master's yet, maybe I'll talk to the rest you and do my MBA, maybe that's, you know, it, it push come to shove. But yeah, so it was a combination of two things. One was a conviction and idea, and secondly was that uh, I, had, I had supportive parents, right? And slowly though, I think uh, a third, supporting point I think that would help a lot of the young entrepreneurs nowadays or people who are um, thinking about joining young company nowadays was that uh, the culture inside large companies while it's very professional it's fine it's not exactly the most dynamic or fun place to be right large company culture right it can be stifling sometimes you um, sometimes a lot of things is just hierarchy Sometimes a lot of things is just the way things are done. Sometimes it's, um, I would say, the values may not be fully aligned with essentially the millennial generation. So that was a third um, factor that I'd say that wanted to that, you know, sort of push me towards um, embarking on, on working with a firm that's a bit younger, a bit more dynamic, that I can play a, a stronger part in crafting its uh, culture and more. Right. So now, essentially, the culture in the firm, to a certain extent, was crafted by me as the way I like it. So it fits me well, so I'm happy. Right. None, of, none of that, you know, one thing that I make sure to, to not have was, you know, um, if your boss is not, has not go home yet, you can't go home. You know, none, 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 none of those stuff. And you can come, like, you know, as and when, uh, not as and when you want, but you can come between um, anywhere from, like, 8 to 11, 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. But if you come at 8, you get you leave at 5, you come at 11, then you leave at 9 or something. So I think they're more flexible, right? Because um, in some countries, they have um, traffic congestion, traffic jam, rush hour traffic. It's a problem. Some of them want to avoid their rush hour traffic so they can come before or after their rush hour. If face them well, they have less stress and they have less, um, you know, they have less stress and less tension during the commute and whether to and from the office and hopefully they translate into better work product in the office too but I don't see why not but some places they are very rigid in like you know 8 o'clock means 8 o'clock like, no matter what so I thought that that was something that could be improved upon right? so that was one so, so these are the three reasons yeah apart from finance or your career uh, what do you think about uh, Andy's philosophy about broken English <laughs> Sorry, what did you say? I encourage uh, my students uh, to speak up. Oh, uh, very speak up. Even though you speak broken English, it's not a perfect. Even though we all speak broken English, just uh, we have to say it out. Ah, yeah. I think that's very important. Right. No, because no. no the reason why, and uh, this is. Both at, both at large companies and especially so for young companies. Why? is because sometimes the person with the best ideas may not be the most articulate, may not have the may or may not have the best uh, best English speaking ability. Right? The best ideas need not recite in the person who speaks the best. Um, and if that is the case, then anyone who is um, serious about building his team or her organization would, would welcome you know people to speak up with uh, their good ideas regardless of how good or bad their English is. That's one. And secondly, by you know essentially raising your hand and say, hey, I need to speak up, uh, it just signals confidence. And confidence is something that is very important, uh, especially uh, in the working world, because if you have confidence, your idea is more likely to be adopted, rightly or wrongly. 
uh, but it also gives the sense of impression that you know what you're doing, that you know what you're talking about, and it helps a lot when it comes to your pay raise period. Cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. So just become. Yeah. Great. I wish to have more uh, Q and A's and then bother him a lot more, but due to uh, the time constraints, yes, yes. I we need to right. Uh, say thank you at this moment, and let's give him a big hand. All right, and hey, thanks again, John. And uh, um, today we have one uh, of you guys here. Come down here, please, and then she or he, her teammates, yes, come down here. And we'll do the presentation about uh, their own argument about uh, Korean airlines and then what's been happening. Yep. Any Q and A's you should expect to have. Okay. You have about five minutes. Can we ask John uh, which airline did you take? Did you come here? Say why. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Sangyeon, and I'll talk about the Korean airline stock price. Uh, first of all, uh, Chairman Cho Boyang Ho, uh, he died in uh, April 8th, right? Uh, and, uh, his family is back to solve the problem of inheritance tax of Joyang, uh, which amounts to 170 billion won uh, through his uh, through his uh, stock based on loans and uh, dividends. Uh, this is why uh, price of Hanjin Kai and uh, Korean Airlines stocks and related triple stocks of uh, share of Hanjin Car and Korean Air and Triple Share uh, sold on expectation that they they would set the uh, high return to set settle uh, in other taxes, but uh, it, it is not expected that uh, the stock prices will increase significantly in the future because it, it has been already sold up so far. And from the April, April 8, uh, you can see this graph uh, on stock price. The critical stock price of Hanji Khan has uh, hit the ceiling. Hanka, uh, for fifth uh, continuous day, we are so Today, April, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, April 15th, uh, trading was suspended to prevent overheating in the stock market. Uh, and uh, she will talk about uh, Asiana Airlines. Uh, how many guys invested in Asiana Airlines or the related Asiana IDT or Air Busan? How many of you invested? Uh, I think they are the uh, real 
winner in this boy <laughs> uh, I think uh, there was a big crisis in Asiana Airlines. So Asiana airline airline owners, Kumu Group, uh, uh, ordered a uh, big kind of uh, Korean development industry, 한국산업은행, to lend 500 billion won for for their debt. Uh, but the rejection of Korean Development Bank uh, can be a good news to Asiana shareholders because their debt is 6 trillion won and now 7 trillion, trillion won is now estimated. And first of all, before the mega selling of Asiana Airlines, uh, there was an expect expectation that the uh, Air Busan and Asiana IPT will be first sold before selling the uh, big Asiana Airlines. But they refused, but their money was too big. And in April 15th, 15, uh, even if uh, they think that uh, selling, selling as Air Busan and IDT, we will, won't be able to make money. So, Kumu Industrial Company uh, kind of, uh, kind of their stock prices uh, increased highly, kind of up some. And Asiana Airlines expected to win the prize. And if the buyers come out, uh, this SK, CJ, and Shilaute, and Hana will be uh, the takeover. Uh, so the, uh, the reason why of the synergy, the reason why is the synergy effect of SK and Hana because they are uh, they sell the oil on their own. So also uh, Shilaute has a synergy effect from hotel and airlines. Uh, so the takeover enterprises based are as follows, and let's think, let's let's, <laughs> let's see uh, the going to the results of uh, of uh, Inmyeong Anonymous. Uh, it is uh, minus ten percent before Asiana sell the, their company, but it increased it highly, and also uh, there was a static. In this low. Minus 20, what percent is that? Uh, minus 20, 20 <laughs> or further. 25% is that right? It was almost 40. Almost 40. 40, 40 percent, okay. Yes. Minus 2. Yes, Jumping up to plus. Plus about wow. around 40. 40. 47%. Cool. Uh, 41%. That's, going that's your virtual investment yeah, performance virtual investment in this semester. Results. All right. And so, go ahead. Yes. Uh, you got one minute. Yes. Uh, this one's as follows. And uh, as you can see, I mentioned about the synergy effects of the takeover. And it is the SK networks, and it is a kind of Hana Uryang group. And they, are, they increased a lot, as you can see. And we have, uh, according to our research, uh, we wanted to ask the professor about the discussion questions about uh, these six questions. And <laughs> due to the time lag, we cannot deliver all of it. So pick one. Pick. <laughs> mm. uh, yes. Let's briefly talk about how will the stock prices of Korean Air and Asiana Airlines form in the future. Ah. Yeah. It is based on yesterday. Okay, so is that your question to me or to yourself? Uh, to the professor or the classmates in here. Okay. Or really talk about this subject. How about, I mean, for the number six is too, what do you say, up in the air. I don't think it's uh, something we can <coughs> talk. Can we go? Back to some other questions there. Is there any reason why price of shares of Kumho is, is going up and that Kumho <coughs> is related to Ashana? So shares Ashana, if Ashana is going to be sold, is there any reason why it will continue to rise? Why do you think it's, it's rising? Getting back to Ashana Airlines. <coughs> They're in trouble, yeah. right? In distress. Doesn't the price have to go down or stay low? Why do they go up? I think uh, it's not the hostel I mean, so either be expected to be take over mm. uh, by SK or Hama. So 
regardless of being hostile or not, the chance of being taken over, right? Would there be some merger premiums is a question, right? So that may be why, okay? So things happen this way um, um, pretty much, right? Um, so quite often we see distressed companies' price going up. All right, in the interest of time, we have to release you guys back to your seats. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. Um, thanks for voluntarily, um, how do you say, um, moving to uh, voluntarily present your own research about the Korean Air, what's been happening in their share prices with the uh, tragedy in their owner's family, okay? If the CEO is out, and if the CEO is out, usually, is it a good news or bad news? Bad news, given that he, is, he was performing good, right? But we found that stock price jumping up like 10%, 20% as he died, which means what? His past performance was not that good, right? So, um, was that an overreaction? because uh, the media was covering the company too, too much? Or is it an evidence of market efficiency showing that bad quality of management? Okay, so that's something worth thinking about. Last time we talked about uh, implied equity premium. And then the good thing about implied equity premium is that it reflects the risk aversion of market investors in real time. Remember? Okay? Market. Equity risk premium is a function of the risk aversion of the investors in the market. More risk averse you become, then implied equity premium jumps up high like this. This is a time of financial crisis, 2008 you said. Okay? Um, if the market is too much willing to take uh, risky assets, then your implied premium goes down. Okay. Now, um, we're going to learn something about uh, security market line today, and there, the slope term is is deeply related to this concept over here. Okay. Now, um, where are we supposed to start? Right, then right. Uh, now, yeah, so cost of equity, right? Cost of equity, um, we start with risk free rate, and then to add the risk premium of your stock, right? We will, uh, we will use CAPM model so that you will have beta and equity risk premium. And then risk premium part, you can use either historical premium and, or implied premium. And then risk free rate, you have to watch out, you have to be consistent um, in terms of maturity and then your currency. And then now that was about total risk and risk premium of market portfolio. Now how about the risk of individual assets? Now the risk uh, of an individual assets. Let's define R sub I as the return of stock I, and then R sub M as the return of market portfolio. And then uh, market risk premium, it's going to be RM minus RF. So RM should be RF plus market risk premium, okay? And then RI should be our F plus risk premium of I. And we want to express that risk premium of I in a, a certain standardized way. So that when I is equal to market portfolio, then you're going to have RM equals RF plus market risk premium. And so let's say risk premium of I, okay, would be equal to some mysterious thing times market risk premium, and let's call, call this mysterious thing as beta, 
Okay, that's the idea. Now, um, risk of an individual asset, right? The risk of any asset is the risk that it adds to the market portfolio. Statistically, this can be measured by how much an asset moves with the market. Last class, I talked intensively about this concept of uh, covariance and variance, right? Why is beta called the, the contribution measure uh, to market risk portfolio, a market portfolio, okay? Beta i should have covariance of ri and rm, but that's not the end, okay? It should have covariance, but the denominator has to be there to be standardizing, okay? The beta is a standardized measure of this covariance obtained by dividing the covariance of any asset with the market by the variance of the market. This is a measure of the non-diversifiable risk for any asset can be measured by the covariance of its returns with, with returns on a market index, which is defined to be the asset's beta. So beta should have variance at the denominator, like this one. So that when i equals m, then this has to be covariance of market index return and itself, which means variance of its own, so that it will be beta. It's a quite standardized approach, okay, uh, measure. Now, the result is that the required return on an investment will be a linear function of beta, market risk, okay? So the required return will be equal to some risk-free rate plus this guy, equity risk premium, times beta. And seemingly the formula above may not look like a linear function of beta because of our usual habit of writing uh, y equals a plus bx, this, that's a linear function, right? So let's rearrange this thing, right? Just flipping it. And finally, rm minus rf looks like a slow term. If we try to plot the linear re uh, relation between beta i and required return, ri, and the straight line that shows the risk-return uh, risk trade-off is called what? Security market line. Okay, security market line. This is different from capital market line. Remember CML? Capital market line, um, what did you have? On, a, on your horizontal axis, there was a standard deviation of your portfolio's return. And then the vertical line, you had expected returns, right? Here, on the vertical line, you'll have what? The same expected return or required return over here, okay? But on your horizontal axis, what would you have? Beta, beta, not the standard deviation of your portfolio, okay? Not the total risk of your portfolio, but your individual securities market risk measure, beta, okay? Has to be here. And when you, when you don't have any market risk, by definition, zero beta, right? Then what would you have as your required return over here? That would be risk-free rate, RF, right? Your intercept should be RF. And then when your beta is equal to 1, right? When your beta is equal to 1, what should be your expected return over here? RM, right? Market return, thank you. Now, now, comes an interesting question. The slope term over here. Slope. What is it? Huh? Market, market premium. Market risk premium. Does everybody agree? Rm minus Rf. Why? It's a rise over run, right? Kyurgi. Slope. Rise over run. Over here, the run is just one unit. And the rise is what? Rm minus Rf, right? So that slope term has to do with your risk aversion. 
investors risk aversion. Okay? Investors risk aversion. Market risk premium, RM minus RM. Does it sound familiar? Didn't I say a couple of pages ago that over here, when the risk aversion is high, if you're scared and you don't want to take much risk, right? Then implied premium goes up like crazy. Okay? Unless you give me this kind of high return, I'm not going to put my money over there. They pull out the money so that the market crashes, right? And over here as well, the slow turn. That's the premium, implied premium or regardless of whether it is implied or historical, okay? Regardless of being historical or implied, the risk premium has to do with investors' risk aversion. So, when the market is very, how do you say, scary and you don't want to put, in, put your money, when the market crashes like crazy, what will happen to this slope? Will it go steeper or flatter? Steeper. Right? It will go like this. When the market is in a bubble, so that you want to, you know, everybody, I mean, this is the moment when your neighbors and then your grandpas and then all your whatever, right? People talk about stocks, right? You should put your money into stocks and then, you know, I want to invest in, in whatever dot com, whatever AI, I want to put my money. Well, what happens to that? situation, it, what happens to the market risk premium and the slope, it flattens, okay, it flattens. Now, uh, the security market line, this is a relation, okay, again, between your market risk measured by beta and your required rate of return, that straight line, okay, that straight line, is this one, okay. And then, um, right, and then a couple of more things to, to talk to you. Um, my arms are short. How do you say? All right, um, so. Beta I R what? F right zero security market line and then in equilibrium okay in equilibrium if the bucket is efficient all the information is reflected in the stock price. All the securities have to line up in this straight line. That's what the captain says. Okay? All the securities in the market have to line up over here if the market is efficient in equilibrium. Um, <coughs> one, RM. Right. But we realize that market is Sorry, but can we use a marker with more ink? More ink, I'm sorry. I wish we had some more ink over here. That's good. Thank you. All right. So, in equilibrium, right? Or if, and then when the market is efficient, then all the securities with your beta will have to exactly on that SMS, security market line. And then you can see the required rate of return over there. Now, we know that market is not efficient sometimes or many times, right? What if the same stock is the same beta, okay? Happens to line up over here, okay? And what if with the same beta, okay? If it lines up over there. Okay, let's say this is one and two, right? What is this situation? Under. Huh? Under. 
under underestimated, underpriced. So the market price is greater than or lower than the true value. Lower than the, lower than the true value. So how do you know that? Well, we assume, let's say, price is equal to what? From S T R R. Let's say we all, we all know this one, okay? And then the only one we don't know is this guy. Let's solve for this one. Let's see expected return. We, we observe the price. We have good information about the uh, cash flows. We just don't have good information about this discount rate. Okay? Can we solve for that one? Yeah, yeah. So in this case, we can solve for the expected return that turns out to be one over here. Okay? Over here. Well, is this expected return higher than the required return? It is higher, which means this guy is higher, bigger, which means the total number is lower. Compared to the true value, I would say true value, uh, I should say this one, R, okay? True value, we don't know, okay? We cannot observe it. Critical ingredient 
uh, in discount cash flow and valuation. Errors in estimating the discount rate or respecting cash flows and discount rates can lead to serious errors. So watch out. At the in initial uh, intuitive level, the discount rate should be consistent with both the risk less, uh, riskiness and the type of cash flows being discounted. Okay? And then uh, whether you use equity versus firm valuation, you have to be consistent. Uh, all these things uh, I told you before. Currency, you have to watch out. And are you using nominal or real rates? Right, you have to watch out again. Cost of equity, right? It's pretty much self-explanatory at this um, part, right? It is just you can read it over there. The cap M, right? I showed you with um, security market line. That's our grandpa asset pricing model, and people came up with um, alternative asset pricing model as we uh, advanced further. Arbitrage pricing model, right? APT, uh, arbitrage pricing theory has been there, uh, and then multi-factor model has been there, and then some proxy model has been there, okay? All these things are not covered in your semester, don't worry about it. But as hedge fund industry and then the finance theory has uh, pr uh, advanced further, these kind of uh, things are being used uh, a little more, okay? Uh, but CAPM is good enough to bother you right now, okay? Uh, essentially, what, what this one, okay, more, uh, I'm, the way I understand it is that multi-factor model, okay, is more generalized form. CAPM, we're using just Market factor, market macro, market factor is just one thing over here. And then everything is summarized with beta, okay? Market, well, and people moved on and said, there seemed to be something more going on. My, uh, something uh, called size factor seems to be there. Somehow, the size of the companies, right? That kind of things. Size is a public information, okay? Shouldn't it be reflected in the price so that we cannot make money by taking advantage of this big size versus small size, the size difference, okay? Um, the idea of market efficiency tells you that using public information, you cannot make money, okay? You cannot make money um, as long as market is efficient, and as long as CAPM is the right asset pricing model, you cannot make money by using size-based factors or size-based characters, right? But, as it turns out, investors seem to be successful by buying small companies and short-selling bigger companies purely based on size character. They can still make money. That's a breakdown of CAPM. There seems to be something more going on with something called the size factor. And some people find out that, oh, um, book to market ratio, or market to book ratio, flip side of it. Book value of assets ver uh, divided by market value of assets, right? That's also a character a public information about the company. So as long as CAPM is correct and the market factor is the only factor that explains the return, you should not be able to make money by investing in low book to market company or high book to market company in a systematic way. That's what CAPM predicts. But researchers found that, oh, still you can make money systematically by um, buying high book to market and short selling low book to market companies. That's a breakdown of CAPM. And then they found some more factors going on. And then they come up with momentum, something called momentum. When the market goes up uh, over like six months uh, period, keep, uh, the winners keep being winners and losers keep being losers. And that his, that's historical information, right? You should not be able to make money as long as CAPM holds, okay? You should not be able to uh, make money by 
buying winners and shooting the losers. But people found that, ah, it still works. The momentum seemed to be another factor. So they came up with multiple factor models and all different uh, theories have been developing so far. Anyway, that's too complicated. One thing for sure, this is the only one that will bother you in this semester, CAPM, right? Our grandpa model. Momentum and those things, you're gonna see that in behavioral finance class next semester. And then, cost of equity, right? Consider the standard approach like this, and then uh, short-term government security rates are used as risk-free rates, and historical risk premiums are used for risk premium, and betas are estimated by regressing stock returns against market returns. And then, uh, cap and beta, right? I told you, I mean, we, we've gone through this concept of beta uh, last class, right? Uh, we are just looking at this same thing in from different angles, uh, this class and next class. This is your ultimate measure of market risk, beta, right? So, this is the path. How do we estimate beta is a big question. How do we estimate beta? A um, couple of ways I would suggest. One is using regression beta, okay? Regression beta. Two is something called bottom of beta using Hamada equation. And three is uh, using weighted average of the betas of the divisions, okay? And uh, this bottom of beta and weighted average of bottom of betas will be a lot of work. Sakjil, in Korean terms, like sakjil, you know, like a lot of work, like crazy, okay? Let's do it. Um, regression beta is the first thing you will look at, right? Uh, standard procedure for estimating betas is to regress your stock returns against market, uh, market returns, like this. Ri equals A plus B Rm. Right, slope term of regression corresponds to the beta of the stack and measures the riskiness of the stack. So, if you see it, um, beta, by definition, it has to be covariance over variance. Covariance of your stack and market over variance of the market. That's precisely what we talked about before, beta, right, the same thing. And it shows up graphically, okay? Um, so... So, always we have to be careful about what's on the vertical axis and horizontal axis. If it is going to be cap M beta, right? Here are M, here are I, your stack. Okay. Regression beta, the most important thing about regression beta is that you are looking back in history. Okay? You need some historical data to run, to run regressions. Our purpose, remember, is to estimate the riskiness of your company going into the future, looking into the future. Let's say car, the Korean air. Uh, how risky would it be going into the future? Uh, Asian Airlines, how risky would it be going into the future? Future, we don't know, but the best guess we can get is from the history. As long as we have historical return data, we can run some regression. So the CAS return over last five years, maybe, okay? you, spe you specify the date range. Usually five years, monthly return works best. Now CAS five years return, and then correspondent market return, S&P 500 or COSP index return, right? during that same time interval, right? So we plot them somehow. And then run a linear regression, okay? And as I drew it, it was not that good. Fine. For a pedagogical purpose, let's say, regression line turned out to be working out, okay? Then this is what? R I equals this guy A A plus beta I R M. Okay. 
that's what we have over here. Okay? Strictly speaking, this is not cafe. Strictly speaking, this is not cafe. What do you mean? Cafe is about excess return. So your market index return in excess of risk-free return should be explaining your company's return in excess of market return. Holy cow, RF. Period by period, you have different RF. Slightly, slightly different, okay? But this is minimal, so that we just ignore them and then run this kind of regression, calling it market model. To be strict in CAPM, right, what we see has to be like this. R A I minus R F should be equal to alpha. Remember this alpha is different from this guy. This is A and this is alpha. In your, uh, in your homework note, I said this is beta zero. Some intercept over here. But this guy, okay? And then this one plus beta of I and R M minus R F, okay? That's cap M, okay? That's cap M. That seems different from this guy, okay, over here. Our F was uh, our intercept. How come alpha is there? You may say it. Okay, you may say it. And then 